I'm going to talk about one of the main concepts in neural networks that is probably behind the success of them. And it's a concept that we don't understand. And my hope is that after this talk, at least some of you would be convinced that this is an interesting problem and would be convinced that you don't need much background to jump into the problem and try to help uh, solve it. So, so you have all uh, heard about AI in the news, and it's always, almost always correspond to deep learning. And deep learning is a, a rebranding of neural network, just they wanted to make it cool. And uh, <laughs> so you, have, you know deep learning can do a lot of interesting things. For example, it can beat human in video games. It can uh, beat human in Go. It can beat human in poker. It can drive cars. Uh, it can even understand patterns, for example. It can do better than a, a, a like certified, trained dermatologist uh, to uh, detect skin cancer or to classify skin cancer. It can do well in translation, almost as good as human. Google uses it in uh, Google Translation. It can also do some other things like being creative. For example, it can generate uh, characters that look like handwriting and you can't tell the difference. Or it can generate faces of, uh, some faces that don't belong to any human, but you, you can't tell the difference. Or it can generate arts. Uh, and recently, it, uh, like many people in other branches of science use it, for example, in physics, in chemistry, in biology, they use it to understand complicated systems that they can't understand themselves. So after this, I want to talk about the simplest, simplest problem. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, it hasn't hit math yet. Yep, that's, that's <laughs> the, more, the most difficult one. So uh, classification is the simplest problem that deep learning started to show its advantage over other, other methods, and it's still one of the main applications that deep learning is doing well. So what's classification? You can think of image classification as one example. So you have a data set of images, and you want to, uh, given an image, you want to predict what uh, object is in the image, what's the main object in the image. So, so for this image, for example, uh, the in this is input. I give this input to my model, and I expect my model to be able to give me some vector in the output that assigns a score to each label. And that score tells me what's the probability of this label being the correct label. For example, this, in this case, my model is doing a good job and assigning highest score to horse. So, one example of such a model could be just linear separators. For example, if I represent this as just a uh, input as just a vector, I can multiply by a weight matrix. <coughs> so if this is d-dimensional, the weight matrix would be 10 times d. And the output would be just a 10-dimensional real number. And that real number is supposed to tell me which, what, which one is the right class. I just pick the one the ma with maximum score. And I can have a loss function that tells me uh, what's the error of my prediction. So if this is like 0 0.6, what's the error? And so the loss function gets the actual label and the output of the function and gives you some number. So the difference between deep learning models or neural networks and uh, like simple, more traditional models is that these are usually composition of parameterized functions. These are more complicated models. And the main thing is that they're over-parameterized. They have tens of millions of parameters. Even if your data set has like 10,000 data points, they train tens of millions of parameters, and they work well. So now I want to explain to you the simplest neural network that can capture the properties of deep learning models, and we want to try to understand it. So just two layer fit, you look at two layer fit forward network. So this is the input. I give the input to the network, and then the network multiplies the input by a weight matrix. So so far everything is linear, and now I. I zero out the negative values. So multiply by weight matrix, zero out the negative values. And this gives me the value that I call the output of hidden units. So each dimension of the output of this is one hidden unit. So number of hidden units in a network correspond to the dimension of the output of v times x and after applying act activation. And then I apply another weight matrix. And that gives me the output of the network. Very simple. I apply the first weight, zero out the negatives, and then apply the second weights that would be the output of the network. As you see, this, if, if I want to look at this function, this fun function is non-convex with respect to the parameters u and v. So now, 
if you look at, so now I want to make it a little bit more crisp. So in, our f in the learning framework, we have input, label, and loss function as I described. We have a distribution that we assume that data is generated from that distribution, both input and labels, but we don't have access to that distribution. So the problem of learning or machine learning is about understanding this distribution without having access to it. The only thing we know about this distribution is the samples that are generated from that distribution. So the hope is to find a predictor that does well on these samples, and then it probably generalizes the distribution. But what, what does it mean, it probably generalizes the distribution? So this I call the test error. The error on the distribution, I call it test error, and that's the goal. We want to do well on new samples on the distribution. So I can decompose it to the gap between test error and training error. Training error is the error on this set. I want to decompose it. This, this tells me how well I'm generalizing to unseen uh, data. And this part it is telling me how, can, how good I'm doing on this set. So this part I can measure, training error. It's the error on this set I can measure. The generalization error, which is a gap between these two, I can try to bound using concentration inequalities. So if so we pick a class, we, we pick a class of functions, we find a function that does well on the training set, which means it has low training error. So I'm minimizing this, I'm finding a function that does well on the training set, and then I bound this generalization error so that I can say something about my test error. For example, if this is a fitting, so let's consider the case of fitting polynomials, if I take the class of fitting polynomials with different degrees, if I increase the degree in the class and I fit larger and larger polynomials, the size, if the size increases, the generalization error goes up because I'm, I'm going to overfit. If I have eight points and I'm going to fit a 10 degree polynomial, it's not going to be a good fit. Uh, if I, if in, I see a new point, I probably will be wrong in uh, fitting that new point. But the terrain error goes down when I increase the size. So size of the hypothesis class or the model class increases, the, general, the generalization error increases and training error decreases. So this is, for example, for uh, feeding polynomials. You see that if you feed a high degree polynomial, if the size increases, it's going to be bad. So what do we know about neural networks? Same, same thing. So, if the si so the size of a hypothesis class, you can think of it as number of parameters. Roughly speaking, the number of samples you require to see generalization, to see that you converge to distribution, correspond to number of parameters. And that is shown for neural networks. I, I reach, sometimes refer to it as capacity. So capacity or complexity, I measure it as how many samples do I need to start seeing generalization. And then it, it has also been shown that you can, uh, there's no algorithm uh, subject to some cryptographic assumption. There's no algorithm that, minimize, that, can, minim that can always minimize the training error. So these are two known facts about neural networks. But it always doesn't hurt to do some experiment and test, is, uh, test our understanding. So I'm looking at this experiment, which is the same experiment as before, but this time with digits, not with uh, objects. So I want to classify these 110 digits to actual digits. And the training set has 60,000 images. So the way we are doing it is very simple, just heuristic. We do gradient descent, <coughs> stochastic gradient descent. We initialize the weights of the network that I explained to you, that UV that I explained to you, to, to be Gaussian, just normal distribution. And then I did each iteration, I use the gradient of the loss function to update the weights. And that's it. So if, if the function was convex, you could show that you can you converge to the uh, global minimum. But the function here is non-convex, so we don't know anything about that. But that's the best we can do. So that's the experiment. Now let's see. Yeah, and now what we want to study is that we want to study if I increase the size of the network, if I increase the number of hidden units in the network, what do I see? Do I get better training error? Do I get worse test error? What's going to happen? So this is the actual experiment. So <laughs> this x-axis is the number of hidden units. So each of these correspond to one experiment on networks with a fixed size. And now I want to measure training error and test error. So for a network with size S, this is the training error and test error. I'm connecting this to see the trend. but each of these is one experiment. Now, if I do the same experiment with larger networks, I get a beta training error, which makes sense because uh, I have a larger set of functions to choose from. I can fit the data better. But the gap between training and test would increase because I'm going to overfit a little bit. Now, if I increase the size again, the gap increases. I get better training error, but then I have a lot of overfitting. And then 
one, one larger net, like 64 hidden units, is enough to completely feed the training data. So a network with 64 hidden units can explain all the 60,000 images. That was the hidden units was the like like the number of entries. It's related to that. It's related. It's related. So hidden num hidden number of hidden units uh, correspond to number of parameters. So basic number of parameters is number of the dimension of input times number of hidden units. Okay. So I guess my question. So is let me go back actually. Are you changing the architecture of your net when you're increasing the? You're, like, are you changing the? No, no, no. These are each of these is separate experiments on neural networks with a fixed number of hidden units. But when you go from 16 to 32. That's a separate experiment. I'm just comparing this in the same plot. Right. This is not, I'm not increasing the size in the same experiment. There are always two layer network. Yeah, all of them are two layer, but each of them have different sides. For each of them, I start from random, I do gradient descent, I converge to a solution, and I, then I measure training error and tester. OK? Okay. Two layers, two layers, just the size increases. Yeah. The yeah. Roughly, yeah. So now, after this point, what's going to happen? If I, if I again go with a larger model, what's going to happen? I already fit the training data, so there's no point in going to larger models. And the expectation is that the tester is going to go up because the gap between, I'm going to overfit more and the gap is going to increase. So I expect to see something like this. And this is the kind of plot that people show in like uh, machine learning, uh, introduction to machine learning courses. But actually, this is what happens. So I, I increase the model size. I increase the model size. And I still get better test error. So what's going on? What, what is it that we do? The theorem are true. So the theorem is true. So what's going on? What is the magic property? What's, what's, what is the magic property of the reality that makes this easy? First of all, we said the optimization should be difficult, but I'm getting zero training error no matter how, how I increase the size. I always get zero training error. And the generalization gets even better. So this, this, this is the opposite of what we expect. So the, so the real magic is that I'm using a very specific optimization algorithm to find the solution. So I'm not. So there are bad solutions that are not going to generalize. There are bad solutions that are going to overfit. They're going to memorize everything and not generalize. But using a simple optimization algorithm that's just a local search makes, makes, uh, converges to a low complexity solution. And I cannot understand what does low complexity mean here, because I cannot capture it with number of hidden units or size of the network. So it's something else. It's some other complexity measure. So to understand it, we, we went to an even simpler problem, which is matrix factorization. So, so the only difference is that now I remove the nonlinearity here. Before I had some nonlinearity, I was zeroing out the negatives after multiplying v. Now I don't have that. So this you can think of as neural network without activation function or with linear activation function. And then because this is linear, I can think of this u times v as a matrix w. And then the rank of this matrix w if the rank is less than R, it means R hidden units. This is the actual correspondence with uh, neural networks. And I can try to understand this. So what we did is that we showed that for this kind of uh, architectures, you can show under uh, mild assumptions, such as if you have like this, if this is linear separator and you're minimizing this loss, you can show that if linear, uh, sorry, linear operator is nearly orthonormal, uh, there is no, every local minimum is global minimum. So basically, if you're doing gradient descent, with some noise, you're not going to get stuck, and you always converge to a, a minimum solution. And you can also show that it actually converges to a solution with minimum. You, we conjecture that it converges to solution with minimum norm. We proved for some simple case, but we showed experimentally that it always converges to a minimum nuclear norm solution. So optimization algorithm is favoring low complexity solution in some way. Here with minimum nuclear norm solution in neural network, we don't know how. So we try to understand this a little bit better in terms of generalization. For matrix factorization, we know there are two ways, like at least two ways of thinking about complexity. One is uh, restricting the rank. Another one is restricting the norm of matrix. For example, nuclear norm, which is the sum of uh, some eigenvectors, uh, some eigenvalues of a matrix. So, so we know practically nuclear norm is a better inductive bias, meaning that if you actually limit the nuclear norm, you can feed the data better and you can generalize better. 
So the hope is that if we can find, uh, if we can bound the complexity of neural network with norms, and we can show the complexity is bounded with norm, independent of how many hidden units we have, we're going to be fine. So in another work, we showed that you can actually bound the complexity with norm, and we showed, for example, for this neural net that we just explained, the complexity capacity or the number of samples required to generalize is roughly bounded by Frobenius, product of Frobenius norm squared of the weights. So we were happy with this until we, we decided to also test this idea that are we actually getting better results or not. So this is the test error I showed you. It's decreasing when I increase the number of hidden units. Ideally, I want to see that this new complexity measure is also decreasing. That tells me that that's why I'm generalizing. But when you do the experiment, this is what you see. So the norm that we try to prove it, it's nice to have a theorem, but it's nicer if your theorem actually tells you something about data. So this was not the answer. OK, so I explained two questions. One was, on what, are, what assumptions we can add to say that the optimization is easy? We know optimization of neural networks is not easy. We know it's hard to optimize. So what is? What is a reasonable, sorry, what's a reasonable set of assumptions I can add? For example, say the input is Gaussian. Let's, let's make it simple. Input is Gaussian. I also assume something about the uh, like, uh, underlying networks in the data. And then I want to say that I can actually optimize it efficiently. So that's one question. Another question is, how can I measure the complexity in a way that explains the data? And I think one hint is that, so over parameterization, makes these networks have a lot of weights, and they look like random. Like if you look at the eigenvectors, if you look at the eigenvalues, they really look like random matrices because they distribute the actual information about data through a lots of weights. So if you just measure the norm, or if you just count the number of parameters, it's not going to tell you how complicated is your model. So we, we need something more clever than just measuring the norms in uh, these networks, and we can and I hope that you can help us understand this.